But let's go ahead and begin this morning by going over and prayer together. Father, it's so good to be here in your house this morning, God. And let's thank you, Lord, for every person that's gathered here. God, we just, um, I, I need this as much as I'm sure the person in this room, just to remind her, God, to just slow down this morning and just to put our minds upon you. Father, the fact that we're gathered here in this room and that, that this is a gathering of eternal beings, that, God, we're going, to, we're going to exist forever. God, help us just to slow down and think about that. Think about what we're doing this morning. As we sing these songs, God, we won't just rush through these songs and just sing the words on the page and on to the next thing. But, Father, we will slow down and really think about and consider what we're singing, what we're saying, um, everything that, that we're taking in this morning, that we would think upon these things. And most importantly, we would think upon you and have our mind upon you. God, you're here with us right now. But, God, we recognize if we're not careful, we can rush in here and rush back down and never even know that you're here, never even realize or experience your presence. So, Father, we want to slow down this morning, and God, just pray for you to be here with us this morning, that we can spend this time together, that this is important time, this is valuable time, and that we would, we would recognize that, God, in relation to you. But God, I, I love you, I thank you, Father, for this church, and I pray your, your blessing and your power to be manifested, God, here in this place, your presence to be manifested here in this place this morning. And as always, God, we thank you so much, Lord, we thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Good luck studying the things that are best. If you need to uh, say a couple of songs here this morning, it talks about the hour and the cross. And uh, I uh, hope pray you get every best out of these songs this morning. This one here, we'll fix the same way I've been singing about six years, I guess, here. But uh, it's a beautiful song. Uh, of course, the person should be able to go ahead and do well with it. It's 439. This 
one of the songs he wrote at the time for Salvation Army. And I've heard people that, that was in such great dire need and that they all the streets and didn't have one hill. And many other things were said about this one. But that's the gentleman that wrote the song. This is the burden on his heart. And uh, the things he thought of when he worked for Salvation Army from the very beginning. The promise is not a but it is grace. Thank you. 
If you want me to turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verses 15 through 17. Ephesians chapter 5, and the title message this morning is, Carefully Consider Your Life. Carefully Consider Your Life. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. If you would please stand in honor of God's Word as we read this together. Carefully Consider Your Life. Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you as always for your word. And God, we recognize that, that God, your word is the authority because you're the authority. And God, a big part of what we do here on Sunday mornings, God, we pray for people to come and who don't know you as Lord and Savior, who've never experienced their uh, forgiveness of their sin and experienced salvation to repent of their sin and to put their faith in you. God, we, we pray for people to be saved here in this place. But God, we recognize that the, the, the primary goal as we meet like this is for believers for us to come together to worship you, to glorify you, to grow and to learn and to be, uh, to be made better disciples, better students of you. And Father, I pray as we're considering this passage of Scripture, God, I pray that, that this would be a time of recalibration for us. God, we go out in the world and just like in, anything that's uh, precise, as we talked about a few weeks ago, any precise instrument as it gets beat and banged and, and taken different places and, and used, it can become, it can get out of calibration. Things can get off. And so, Father, I pray that you would recalibrate us, myself included, this morning, that you recalibrate us with your word and with the truth so that we can go out and live the truth, and not a distorted version of the truth, but to really live the truth as you have revealed it. God, that's our goal this morning. That's always our goal, and I pray that that would be accomplished this morning. I recognize I can't accomplish it, but you can through your Spirit, your Holy Spirit being here with us, the Spirit of Christ being here with us this morning, having the mind of Christ given to us through the Holy Spirit, that, God, you can accomplish this, and, God, you can give us deep and glorious revelation. So, Father, I thank you, God, for this time, and I pray your blessing upon it now. And we pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. You know, as we come together like this, and the one thing I'm always emphasizing, I always will emphasize, is I don't want us to just, you know, go through the motions of things. I want us to be thinking. And I'll tell you, one of the worst places in the world where you can go and just, just check out mentally, turn your brain off for a little bit, and then you go back down to your brain, I call it, is it church? That happens in churches all the time. People just say, well, I need to go to church. I'll show up. I'll sit in the chair. S things will happen. People will talk, maybe some singing, and then I'll leave, and that's the extent of it. That's a lot of people's experience with church. I met the requirement. But, you know, I want us to be thinking. And we sang a song earlier. This is one way I want you to be thinking. As I'm, as I'm singing these songs, I'm reading these songs. I mean, as we go, I like going to the verses because I'm like, well, what's this guy going to say next? What's this lady going to say next? What, you know, what's the next thing that they're, they're sharing? And one of the songs we, we sang earlier mentioned Calvary, which is the, the hill, the way we describe the hill where Jesus was crucified. And it said, dark Calvary. And then it said, blessed Calvary. Oh, Calvary, dark Calvary. Oh, Calvary, blessed Calvary. Well, which one is it? Is it dark or is it blessed? That's part of the, that's part of the paradox. 
because it's both. It is, it is the most sinful act ever perpetrated. It was the greatest act of love ever perpetrated, ever carried out. That's the cross. When we think about the cross, I want you to think about the cross. The implications of that, the depths of that. These are deep, deep things that we're talking about. So of all places, do not check out when you come in this room. I want you to be thinking about what we're singing, what you're hearing, what's being said, what you're saying, what I'm saying. I want us to be fully engaged as we come together like this. And with that thought in mind, we look at this passage of Scripture. You notice the word circumspectly. Circumspect. That is not a word that you're going to hear every day. What does it mean? See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What does that mean? Well, circumspect means if you do something circumspectly, you do it cautiously. It's the opposite of making like a risky decision or acting in a risky way. You do it cautiously. It's to do something in a calculated way, to do something with careful consideration. And in this context, it's about our walk. It's our, our walk in this world. Our, our, our walk is our life, how we live our daily life. It means to do something care, with careful consideration. So in this context, it's about living your life, your walk, your life, living your life with careful consideration. Live your life with careful consideration, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Making the most of your time. Not wasting our time and not wasting our life. And you understand a wasted life is just the accumulation of wasted time equals a wasted life. A wasted day, wasted week, month, year, decade equals a wasted life. We cannot waste our time. We must redeem the time. We cannot waste our time. And we cannot waste our life. He goes on to say that for the days are evil. And I think we've experienced as a church in the last two weeks some things associated with this church, you know, tragedies that are a reminder that the days are evil. We're in a, we're in a fallen world. We're in a broken world. So redeem the time. For that reason, redeem the time. Even more incentive not to waste time. But then it raises the question, again, I want us to be thinking when we come together like this. We have to ask a more detailed question and say, okay, so, so not as fools, but as wise. Not foolishly, but doing things in a wise manner. What's the difference? What, who, how do we know the difference between the wise decision and the foolish decision in any particular case? But then it goes on and says, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understanding. This is, what, this is what it's really saying. Understanding what matters to God and what doesn't matter to God. Because God decides what matters. Are you living your life in, in goals that are worthwhile? You don't know the answer to that. God has to give you the answer. God is the one who decides what matters and what doesn't. And if we're not careful, we'll think things that don't matter do matter, and the things that, that do matter, we think, we'll think that they don't matter. Understanding the will of the Lord. And that's why I'm saying this morning, I want you this morning, I want you to think about this, I want you to stop. Stop what you're doing. And carefully consider your life. Stop living life for a minute and consider your life. I talked to a lady several years ago now, I guess it's been two or three years ago. She and I were around the same age. And I, I just asked her this real general question of saying, you know, um, so, so, you know, why do you think that you exist? Why do you think that you're alive? What's the purpose of life? You know what her answer was? I've never thought about it. She's in her late 30s. And I mean, she was just being honest. It's never crossed my mind. I've never thought about, well, what's the purpose of my life? I've never thought about it. That guarantees a wasted life. I've never thought about it. I just, I just do things, 
You know, everybody else is, was going to school, so I went to school. I guess, I guess I could get in trouble if I didn't, so I just went along with the crowd. Everybody else went to school. I went to school. Everybody else, they got out of school. They, they either went to, kept going to school or they got a job, so I got a job, and I'm just, I'm just on this conveyor belt. Where's it going? I don't know. <laughs> It's going so, I mean, it's different. I'm, I'm further down this conveyor belt than I was a minute ago. Uh, what's the destination? Beats me. Beats you. <laughs> Don't you care? I mean, we, we need to, it, it, it's insane to not think about that. We need, to, we need to carefully consider our life. And that's what I'm saying this morning. Is I want you to stop. Stop living life for a minute. And carefully consider what your life is and how you're living your, your life this morning. Are you living wisely or foolishly? And that's in God's eyes. Because let me go ahead and tell you this. Think about yourself personally. Are you living wisely or foolishly? But let me give you this little added extra piece of information. Every man is wise in his own eyes. So unanimously, this word will say, of course I'm living, I'm making wise decisions. Of course I'm living a wise life. Because every man is wise in his own eyes. But are you living a wise life in God's eyes? Or are you living a foolish life in God's eyes? Because his eyes are the ones that matter. He's the one who decides what matters. Let me ask you this. Did you make, think about, let's make this very tangible. Did you make wise decisions yesterday, or did you make foolish decisions? What about this past week? Let me make it more tangible. How much time did you spend with the Lord yesterday? If the answer is none, that's a foolish answer. Wrong answer. That's a foolish answer. If I pick any day of the week... And I ask, how much time did you spend with the Lord in prayer, in His Word? How much time did you spend with Him? If you say, if I'm honest, none, that's a foolish answer. Now we can talk about, should it be, i tell you this, five minutes is a foolish answer too. Ten minutes is a foolish answer. 30 minutes, an hour, how much time? Which, you know, we can get into that, some of that detail but we know that the answer of none or very little is a foolish answer. Stop making foolish decisions and make wise decisions. You better spend time with the Lord. And I say that for myself as well. Let me ask you another question, another tangible question. How many people did you share the gospel with this past week? Can you think of names? If your answer is none, that's a foolish answer to give. You better stop giving that answer. You better start giving a different answer. This week, the gospel matters. And I say this week, you know, maybe, maybe a day goes by, you don't get an opportunity, but a week? What did you talk about, if not the Lord? Do you know something more interesting than the Lord? I don't. And you know what you think, Jordan, you're, you're, you know, that's getting kind of rough. That's getting, I, my answer's been none a lot, probably more than yours. And when I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying this honestly and objectively, none is a foolish answer, and I've given it so many times in my life. I've wasted so many days, so many weeks. I don't want to waste anymore. I don't want you to waste anymore. We need to redeem the time because God told us to redeem the time. That's the challenge. I'm not beating you up this morning, but that's the challenge this morning. I don't want you to waste your life, and neither does God. That's why I'm preaching on this this morning. You know, I could have just read through this passage of Scripture, and you could have sat there, and, and this is what happens. You could sit there and say, I'm living a wise life. Look, I'm at church this morning. I'm living wisely. And you go right back out. But when I start getting more tangible, more detailed, it gets more challenging. And this message is going to be challenging this morning. I, I intend for it to be challenging for you and for me. The question isn't, are you living wisely in your own eyes? The entire world is living wisely in their own eyes. The question is, are you living wisely in God's eyes? Because His determination is the only one that matters. I say this respectfully. I care to a degree what you think about me, but in another sense, I don't care what you think. I care what He thinks. And you need to care what He thinks far more than you care about what I think. 
because he is the only one that matters. Moving on to James chapter 4. This was the main passage of Scripture I wanted to begin with this morning, but I looked back on Ephesians and thought, man, that fits right in with what we're talking about. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. A very familiar passage. I hope it's familiar to you because it's got a very important message contained within it. James, this is the, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, same mother, different father, Jesus being virgin-born. But James is the son of Joseph and Mary, and he saw Christ resurrected. He was an unbeliever. He rejected Christ while Christ walked this earth, but after he resurrected, he appeared to James, and James became a believer in Christ and a leader in the church. Listen to what he writes here. He says, Go to now, or come now, you that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now I want to say this, there's a false statement on this screen. Do you see it? There's something on this screen right here that is false. What is it? Well the clue should be, this part's God's Word, that part's Jordan's Word, so that's the false part. You're, you are not a vapor. I've got it written up there, you are a vapor, and I was going to try to rush in here and change on the slide, but I thought, it'll stand out more if I don't do that. That's a false statement. You are not a vapor. Your life in this world is a vapor. You're an eternal being. You are not a vapor. You can't vanish away. Because you're created in the image of God. And part of what comes with that, part of being created in the image of God, of the infinite being, is you become an eternal being when God created you, when God created mankind. Adam was an eternal being. He was an eternal being who then reproduced and produced eternal beings. You're an eternal being. But your life in this world is a vapor. Your life in this world is a mist. Let me give you an example of your life. That's it. Now you see it. Now you don't. That's your life. Now young people may be like, <laughs> my life's going, I mean, I've been, in, I've been in high school forever. You know, I've been in middle school forever. Young people may say, it doesn't seem that way. To the older, the more gray you, you have, and I got quite a bit myself for 41, um, but the more gray you have, the more you realize, yep, that's about it. It's there. I mean, you can see that, can't you? It's visible, you can see it, and then it's gone. That's what the Bible says your life is. It's a mist. I was realizing the other day, they were, you know, things just move on. Let me ask you this question very quickly. Who do you think is the greatest NBA basketball player of all time? Somebody yell them out. Just yell. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Who? Who else? LeBron. LeBron, LeBron James? Um, anybody else? What's that? Kobe Bryant? Somebody say Russell? Bill Russell? You may say Wilt Chamberlain. Some people said Wilt Chamberlain is the greatest athlete to ever live. They may be right. Um, how many championships did uh, Michael Jordan win? And this tests my memory a little bit. Six? How many did Bill Russell win? Eleven. Eleven. You said Michael Jordan a minute ago. If my, 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 I'm not a mathematician, but 11's a lot more than 6. And Bill Russell didn't even score that many points, but he was so smart. But here's the thing, Tom has forgotten Bill Russell. Man won 11 NBA championships. 
but many people in this room, even people who really love basketball, may have never even heard his name. Because time marches on and you get forgotten because you're a mist. And that mist that I sprayed a minute ago, I can't even smell the Lysol anymore. That's the way your life is. Bill can smell it still. Maybe it's moving that way, <laughs> away from me. I'm wearing him out up here. Probably I'll have to move to the back of the church. But you get the point. You realize everything you're doing in your life, your career. And I, I'm not saying this to, to cause you to, to despair or to like, um, but the fact is, whatever your business, the money you're earning, all this stuff, you, you realize 100 years from today it's completely forgotten. It's not going to matter. It's important you know that now because it's a fact. It's a fact of reality. People know their grandparents. Some people know their great-grandparents. Very few, very, very, very few people know their great-great-grandparents. All they are is a name. They're not even a memory anymore in this world. That's the nature of this life. Generations are going to go on. Your life in this world is a vapor. But Adam still exists. Eve still exists. The unnamed people in Scripture who lived in Egypt at the time of Moses still exist. But their life in this world was a vapor that was here for a little while. Now it has vanished away in this life. And I'm saying all this this morning because that fact and that reality needs to, ch needs to inform us and that should change how we live our life. Because our priorities get out of order. Our life gets away from us. And we just run through life hurried, frustrated, and discontent. And I'm guilty of that. Just the next thing. On to the next thing. Just keep checking the list. Keep adding the list, checking the list. Adding the list, checking the list. Adding the list, and then you die. That's life. Hurried frustrated because this item took long, took twice as long as it should have taken. Now I'm behind on the next item. It's the rat race. I mean, you're, you're running, and it's thinking like a hamster wheel. You know, this hamster's running. This one's just running. He's running at a moderate pace. This one's just running out crazy. They're, they're, good, they're making the same progress. That's, that's, what, that's what this life is like. We rush through life. It gets away from us. We rush through life hurried and frustrated and discontent. But your life is a mist, and you have no time to waste. So what does it look like to not waste time? The answer is it's probably the opposite of what you think. It's probably the opposite of what you think. Now let's see a, again, I like a tangible example. And so let's see a tangible example of what this looks like. To not waste your life. And, and that passage of Scripture, going back to, uh, to James 4, listen to what this says. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, you're going to have opportunities in this life to do good. Do not miss those opportunities. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. What does that look like? This is the person who's, who's going to go do this and that, and they're, they're just rushing and rushing. But they miss opportunities to do good. To him that know what to do good, you get that opportunity and you miss it. To him it is sin. What does that look like in real life? Let's go over to Luke chapter 10, where we'll finish this morning. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. What's a tangible example of what this looks like? Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. It says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up. So Jesus is teaching, and an expert in the law stands up and says to him, Master, what shall I do to have eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? So I mean, he's on the right track. He's talking about eternal life. He recognizes temporal life, you lose. You always lose. But he's asked the right question. What do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, um, what does the law say? What, is it, what do the scriptures say? What, how have you read it? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That's Jesus' answer. 
It's, it's not just what he read. That, all of that is in the Old Testament that Jesus quoted from. But Jesus has been asked this question before. What's the greatest commandment? He just rattled it off. So this lawyer has heard that answer. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is locked into it, love your neighbors yourself. That lawyer heard that answer. So he said, okay, what do I have to do eternal life? He said, what are you reading the law? He said, love the Lord my God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love my neighbors myself. That's what Jesus says. God has answered rightly, you're right. Do that and you'll live. You'll live eternally. I love it. Verse 29. But he willing to justify himself said, and who, and who is my neighbor? So, I mean, this is, I got a lot riding on this. I need to love my neighbors myself, but I have a good question. Who exactly is my neighbor? I need more, I need more detail. I love this question. It's not asking sincerity. He, it's self-righteousness. He's trying to justify himself. Luke rec even records that fact. But he's asking for more detail. He wants a tangible example. What does this look like in daily life? And Jesus is more than happy to answer, okay? Let me tell you a story. Verse 30. Jesus answering said, A certain, certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I mean, for us, that's... Um, a guy was driving to Knoxville. I mean, it's an everyday type thing, just the most, I mean, from Jerusalem to Jericho. So a man's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, it wasn't that he didn't see him, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, who was like a, a helper to the priest, serving at the temple, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Go back. What happened here? What happened? There was a huge breakdown. This was an emergency. There's a man in, in, in he is in an emergency need. Oh, great, a priest. Hit. Okay, there's somebody coming by, and it's a priest. Good, help has arrived. And help goes right past. So, something has broken down terribly in this story. Why did they pass by? What happened? You know what happened? They had somewhere else to be. They had somewhere else to be. They were too busy. You don't travel that road for leisure. They've got to get to Jericho. They had somewhere else to be. They were too busy. And you want to hear just how twisted this is? They're a priest and a Levite. They were too busy serving God. Most likely they were going to Jericho in service to God. But they were so busy, they couldn't stop and help this man. What happened is this. They were too busy to love their neighbor. They were too busy to love. Have you ever been that busy? I thought I've, I, I, there's times I've thought I was that, I was that busy. They were too busy to love. If I'm looking at this and I'm dissecting to say, what happened? They failed to love. This was a failure to love, a love failure, a breakdown of love. Are you ready for this? All sin, without exception, 
every single sin is a failure to love in every case. And all sin, every single sin, is selfishness, without exception. Every time you have ever sinned, it was because you were selfish. And every time you have ever sinned and I have ever sinned, it was because I failed to love. Let me give you another tangible example. How about pornography addiction? What causes that? It is a failure to love the people who are being exploited. And it's a failure to love God who said, that's not good for you. That's where it comes from. But I don't care about any of that because I like what I see. Selfishness. A failure to love and choosing to be selfish. It's every single sin. That's how big this story is. It covers it all. They failed to love. This was a failure to love, a love failure, a breakdown of love. These guys knew better. That's why Jesus, I, I, I don't think this story actually happened, but that's why Jesus said, and it was a priest, he knew better. It was a Levite, they knew better. To them it was sin. They sinned against God when they changed lanes. That was a sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to them it is sin. Is that what James said? This is, this is what that looks like. And here's the other thing. They wasted their time. What they went to Jericho to do was a waste of time. I ain't got time for this. They went on past. You wasted your time. Because love takes time. But it's never wasted. But you ask the question, I mean, I want to really dissect this and think this through. I want you to think this through even long after we leave this room this morning. But I want you to also think about what should have happened. What should have happened here? Praise God, Jesus keeps, keeps going. Julie, if you would go to the next slide. Jesus continues, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? So who was the neighbor? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. I've heard that story a thousand times. It hits me as hard today as it ever has. That's a powerful story. It's like getting kicked. Getting kicked in the chest when you read that. It is simple, but it is powerful. Let me make the controversial. Was, this was so controversial. This is such a provocative story. But we don't even see the controversy of it. Let, let me get the controversy into your head the way it was in the person who heard this story. A Baptist pastor came by and changed lanes. But then a Baptist deacon came by. But then he changed lanes. But then this gay man came by. And he stopped. And he helped him. But then a Muslim came by. And he hit the brakes. And he went over and helped him. And probably the best example would be something like this. But then a Mormon came by. 
That's probably the most, the Samaritans were heretical in their beliefs. Now understand, Jesus is not affirming Samaritan theology here. He's just saying there were three guys. Which one showed love? That's, that's, why, that's all this story is covering. He's not, he's not endorsing Samaritan theology. Just like if I were to say a Baptist pastor, a Baptist deacon, and a Mormon, I'm not, I'm not um, affirming Mormon theology, but the fact is the Mormons stopped and showed love. That's the controversy of this story. The Samaritan... And Jesus told it that way on purpose, to get, to get our attention, to get this man's attention, to get your attention. Talk is cheap. Titles are worthless. A Samaritan. And you notice he can't even say Samaritan? He said the one who showed mercy. I mean, he's identified the story. There's a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Who showed mercy? Or excuse me, um, who, was the, who was the neighbor? He that showed mercy. No, his name was Samaritan in the story. He couldn't even say the word. He could not even say the Samaritan. He said the one who showed mercy. And therefore Jesus says, go and do likewise. This is a challenging story. And I want you to understand something. That Samaritan man in this story, I know it's, even though it may be a hypothetical story, the Samaritan man was a day late. He was late. He's going to Jericho. He, he got there a day late. To the eternal glory of God, he got there a day late. The Samaritan man was a day late, but he wasn't late. In fact, he was right on time. He arrived on the day that he should. The priest and the Levite, they showed up a day early. They should not have been in Jericho. Why? Because they should have stopped. On their timetable and on the timetable of those who were waiting for them, they were right on time. On God's timetable, they were a day early. They should never have been in Jericho when they got there. They should have stopped. They should have arrived a day later. The Samaritan arrived a day later right on time. He should have been late by his schedule and by the schedule of those who might have been waiting on him. That's what I'm talking about. The priest and Levite were a day earlier than they should have been, and it was a wasted trip. That's what I mean by not wasting time. Who sets your schedule, you or God? Who sets my schedule, me or God? That's what I'm talking about, not wasting our time. That's what Paul means by redeeming the time. As we, as we close this morning, there was another story that came to mind as I was reading this account. And so I went looking for it. And I typed it in, I go find it. Guess where I found it? The next verse, verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went. And he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him, came to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou care not that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, 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 thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Martha was worried about many things that do not matter. Mary, whose life is a vapor in this world, was at Jesus' feet doing something that had eternal consequences. We're still talking about it today, 2,000 years later. She was doing something of eternal consequence. She was loving Christ at his feet. I put in the slide here, I love Martha. You know why? Because of this. Jordan, Jordan. Jesus says that to me every day. Jordan, Jordan. Maybe you need to insert your name there. You're worrying about the wrong things again. You're stressing about the wrong things. 
Jordan, we go over this every day. Jordan, Jordan, remember what matters. And remember what doesn't matter. I am Martha. I probably identify with her more than anybody else in the entire Bible. I am Martha. This little story, again, is so instructive. I get too busy serving Jesus to worship Jesus. That's what's happening here. Mary is worshiping Jesus. Martha ain't got time to worship Jesus. She's having to start fix sandwiches for Jesus. Jesus, Jesus fasted for 40 days. I don't want a sandwich. I want you to come and sit at my feet. That's where you should be. I get too busy serving Jesus to worship Jesus. I get too busy serving Jesus to love Jesus. I don't have time to love you right now. I'm serving you. I've got phone calls to make, emails to send. I've got, I've got to do this. I've got, yesterday we had our men's uh, work day. Our devotion went like an hour and a half. How, oh, how tempting. Oh, how tempting to jump in. Say, guys, we need to wrap this up. We've got trees to plant. Burn the trees. Let's talk about things that matter. Let's talk about being created in the image of God. Let's talk about those tough questions of life. What's the difference between killing and murder? There's a huge difference. One's a sin and one's not. Let's talk about uh, how to live life in this world in a way that's, that's godly and, and glorifying to God. That's what we need to make time for. That's what matters. Let's take that time. But I'm so guilty all the time. You may say, Jordan, you've beaten me to death this morning. I'm beating me to death this morning. I'm talking to myself with this message. If it applies to you, then you need to hear it as well. But I want to challenge myself. I want to challenge you. We get in such a rush, such a hurry. Too busy serving Jesus to love him. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask Bill to come if he would. I ask everybody to stand. Ask Bill and Margaret to come. And Tori, who else? Anybody who else am I missing? I'll say all this this morning to say we need to carefully, I'm going to say this again, and hopefully you hear it differently at the end of this message you heard at the beginning. You need to carefully consider your life. And I need to carefully consider my life. We need to redeem the time. Our life is short. Our time is short in this world. We need to rush. We need to rush. We need to rush to the right things. We need to rush to help others. When I, need somebody, when I see somebody in need, I need to rush to love them. That's the rush. I think that's Samaritan. I, I think... I think that's Samaritan. I think he was, I think he jumped off his, his donkey to go over and help that man in need. I think he did rush, but he rushed the right way. He, he redeemed the time. So this guy said, well, I've got, I've got to help him right now. What if those guys come back? I think he rushed. We need to rush to help others. We need to rush to love others. <laughs> We need to rush to love Jesus. We need to rush to love Jesus. When we wake up in the morning, we need to rush and hurry to be the first to get to Jesus' feet every morning, every day. We want the best spot at his feet. When you wake up in the morning, first priority in the morning is, I've got to get to Jesus. I need to worship him. I need to love him. And then everything else. We have today. That's it. You have right now. Probably already in your mind you're thinking, okay, what do I have to do after this or this? You have right now. You have right now. We have today. And today's the day of salvation. If you're here this morning... You're not a Christian. You need Christ urgently. You need Christ.
if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, you need to carefully consider your life. You need to carefully consider your life.